Alright, today we're starting the second chapter of The Call of the Wild by Jack London. It is called The Law of Club and Fang. Buck's first day in his new home was a nightmare. Every hour was filled with shock and surprise. All was confusion and action, and every moment he had to be alert. He discovered that these dogs and men were not civilized. They were savages, all of them. Who knew no law but the law of the club and fang? He had never seen dogs fight as these wolfish creatures fought. Curly was a victim of the first fight Buck witnessed. They were camped near the log store where Curly, in her friendly way, approached a husky dog not half as large as she. There were no warning, only a leap and a flash, a scissoring clip of the teeth, a leap out, and Curly's face was ripped open from eye to jaw. It was a wolf manner of fighting to strike and leap away, but there was more to it than this. Thirty or forty huskies ran to a spot and surrounded the, the combatants in a circle. Curly rushed her attacker, who struck again and leaped aside. He met her rush with his chest, which tumbled her off her feet. She never got up again. This was what the onlooking huskies had waited for. They closed in upon her, snarling and yelping, and she was buried, screaming with agony beneath the hoard. Francis, swinging an axe, sprung up into the mess of the dogs. Three men with clubs were helping him to scatter them. Two minutes from the time Curly fell to the ground, the last of the, her attackers were clubbed away. But Curly lay there limp and dead in the bloody snow. This scene often came back to Buck and troubled him in his sleep, so that this was the way he realized. No fair play. Once down, that was the end of you. Well, he would see to it that he never went down. Before he had recovered from the shock caused by the tragic death of Curly, he received another shock. Francis fastened upon him his, an arrangement of straps and buckles. It was a harness, such as he had seen men put on the horses at home in California. And as he had seen horses work, so he was set to work, hauling Francis on a sled to the forest that, that framed the valley and returning with a load of firewood. Though he disliked being made a work dog, he was too wise to rebel. He buckled down with a will and did his best, but it was all new and strange. Francis was stern, demanding instant obedience, and got it by the use of the whip, while Dave, the dog behind Buck, nipped, muck, nipped Buck's hindquarters whenever he made a mistake. Spitz was the leader, and he growled sharply at Buck now and again. Buck learned easily and made remar remarkable progress. Before they returned to camp, he knew enough to stop at Ho to go ahead at Mush, to swing wide on the bends and to keep clear of the dogs behind when the loaded sled shot downhill at their heels. These trees very good dogs, Francis told Parrot. That buck, he pull like crazy. I can teach him quick as anything. By afternoon, Perrault, who was in a hurry to be on the trail with his mail, returned with two huskies, Billy and Joe, two brothers. Sons of one mother, though they were, they were as different as day and night. Billy's one fault was he was too much too good-natured, when Joe was the very opposite, sour and a loner, with a snarl always on his lip and an evil glimmer always in his eyes. Buck welcomed them in a friendly way, but gave, but Dave ignored them, and Spitz proceeded to try to bully first one of them and then the other. Joe would have none of that and clipped his jaws together at the dog team leader. But soft Billy offering no resistance was driven to the ends of the camp. By evening, Paralot had bought another dog, an old husky, long and lean, with a battle scarred face and a single eye. He was called Solex, which means the angry one in the native's tribe language. He did not like to be approached on his blind side, and Buck was unlucky enough to discover this in a painful way. Solex suddenly whirled on him and slashed with his long teeth, Buck's shoulders to the bone. Forever after, Buck avoided his blind side and they never had any more trouble. Like Dave, Solex's only desire seemed to be 
to be left alone. That night, Buck faced a great problem of sleeping. The tent, lit by a candle, glowed warmly in the mist of snow. And when he decided to enter it, both Perilot and Francis cursed him and threw pots and lids at him till he fled into the outer cold. The chilly wind was blowing that nipped him sharply and bit with special pain into his wounded shoulder. He lay down on the snow and tried to sleep, but the frost soon drove him shivering to his feet. Miserable, he wandered, wandered about among the many tents, only to find that one place was as cold as another. Here and there, savage dogs rushed upon him, but he bristled his neck hair and snarled, for he was learning fast, and they let him go on his way. Finally, an idea came to him. He would return and see how his own teammates were making out. To his surprise, they had disappeared. Again, he wandered about through the large camp, looking for them, and again he returned. Were they in the tent? No, they could not be, or else he would not have been driven out. Then, where could they possibly be? With drooping tail and shivering body, he circled the tent. Suddenly, the snow gave way beneath his forelegs, and he sank down. Something wriggled under his feet. He sprang back, bristling and snarling. But a friendly little yelp reassured him, and he went back to look. A whiff of warm air came to his nose, and there, curled up under the snow in a snug ball, lay Billy. He whined invitingly, squirmed and wiggled to show his goodwill. So that was the way they did it, eh? Buck selected a spot, proceeded to dig a hole for himself. In a minute, the heat from his body filled the tight space, and he was asleep. The day had been long and hard, and he slept well though he growled and barked and wrestled with bad dreams. He did not open his eyes till roused by the noises of the waking camp. At first, he did not know where he was. It had snowed during the night, and he was completely buried. The snow walls pressed him on every side, and fear swept through him that he had been trapped. The muscles of his whole body tightened, the hair on his neck and shoulders stood on end, and with a ferocious snarl, he bounded straight up into the blinding day, the snow flying about him in a flashing cloud. Before he landed on his feet, he saw the white camp spread out before him, and knew where he was and remembered all that had passed from the time he went for a stroll with Manuel to the hole he had dug for himself the night before. A shout from Francis greeted him. What I say, the driver called to Paralot. That buck for sure learned quick as anything. Perilot nodded, a man carrying important business for the Canadian government. He was anxious to have the best dogs. Three more huskies were added to the team that hour, making a total of nine. And before another quarter of an hour had passed, they were in the harness and swinging up the trail toward the Daya Canyon. Buck was glad to be away and though the work was hard, he found he did not dislike it. Dave was Wheeler, or Sled Dog, and pulling in front of him was Buck, then Celesque. The rest of the team was strung out ahead, single file, to the leader, which was Spitz. Buck had been purposefully placed between Dave and Celesque so that he might receive instruction. As quick a student as he was, they were quick learners quick teachers, never allowing him to remain in error for long. Dave was fair and never nipped Buck without cause. Once during a brief stop, when he got tangled in the traces and delayed the start, both Dave and Celeste flew at him. After that, Buck took good care to keep the traces clear, and before the day was gone, he had mastered his work so well that his mates had ceased nagging him. It was a hard day's run up the canyon, through sheep camp, past the scales and the timber line, across glaciers and snowdrifts, hundreds of feet deep, and over the great Chilkut Divide, which stands between the salt water and the fresh, and guards the sad and lonely north. They made good time down the chain of lakes, which fills the craters of extinct volcanoes, and late that night pulled into the huge camp at the head of Lake Bennett where thousands of gold seekers were building boats for the time in the spring when the ice would break up. 
Buck made his hole in the snow and slept deeply, but was woken up early in the cold darkness and harnessed with his mates to the sled. That day they made 40 miles, the trail being packed, but the next day and for many days to come, and for many days to follow, they broke their own trail, worked harder, and made worse time. As a rule, Paralot traveled ahead of the team, packing the snow with lead shoes to make it easier for them. Francis, guiding the sled, sometimes exchanged places with him, but not often. Paralot was in a hurry, and he prided himself on his knowledge of ice. For the fall ice was very thin, and where there were swift water, there was no ice at all. Day after day, Buck toiled in the traces. Always they broke camp in the dark, and the first gray of dawn found them hitting the trail with fresh miles reeled off behind them. And always they pitched camp after dark, eating their bit of fish, crawling to sleep into the snow. Buck was terribly hungry. The pound and a half of sun-dried salmon, which was his ration for each day, seemed not nearly enough. He suffered from hanger pains. <clears throat> Yet the other dogs, because they weighed less and were born to the life, received a pound only to the fish and managed to keep in good condition. He swiftly lost his old eating habits, where he took his time over his meals. For he found here that his mates, finishing first, robbed him of the unfinished ration. There was no defending it. While he was fighting off two or three dogs, it was disappearing down the throats of the others so he learned to eat as fast as they. And because of his own hunger, he sometimes even stole from them. He watched and learned. When he saw Pike, one of the new dogs, slyly steal a slice of bacon from Paralot's back, when Paralot's back was turned, he tried the same trick the next day, getting away with a whole chunk. The first theft marked Buck as fit to survive an unfriendly world of the North. It marked his ability to adapt to changing conditions. It marked, as well, the going to pieces of his moral nature. It was all well enough in the Southland under the law of love and fellowship to respect private property and personal feelings. But in the Northland, under the law of club and fang, it was foolish to do so. It was not that Buck reasoned this out. He unconsciously adapted himself to the new mode of life. All his days, no matter what the odds, he had never run from a fight. But the club of the man in the red sweater had beaten him into a primitive code. Now he must always save his own hide. He did not steal for the joy of it, but because of the demands of his stomach. He did not rob openly, but stole secretly and cunningly, out of respect for club and thing. His physical development was rapid. His muscles became hard as iron and he grew indifferent to all ordinary pain. He could eat anything, and his body was able to use it. His sight and sense of smell became remarkably keen, while his hearing developed such sharpness that in his sleep he heard the faintest sound and knew whether it meant peace or danger. He learned to bite the ice out with his teeth when it collected between his toes, and when he was thirsty there was a thick coat of ice over the water hole. He would break it by rearing and striking it with stiff forelegs. And not only did he learn by experience, but instincts long dead became alive again. The domesticated generations fell from him. In vague ways, he remembered back to the youth of his breed, to the time when he, when the wild dogs ranged in packs through the ancient forest and killed their meat as they ran it down. It was no task for him to learn to fight with cut and slash and the quick wolf snap. In this manner his ancestors had fought, and old life was renewed in him. When on the cold, clear nights, he pointed his nose at a star and howled long and wolf-like. It was his ancestors, dead and dust, pointing nose at star and howling down through centuries and through him. And the reason he came into a sense of his own deeper self was because Men had found a yellow metal in the north, and because Manuel was a gardener, gardener's helper, whose wages were not enough to pay for the needs of a wife, children, and gambling. That concludes chapter two. Next time we will read 
to fight for leadership.